everyone, so in this episode I'm going to try to explain to you sort of what Dotna Core is and this is going to be more of a chill down, have a coffee or a cup of tea while you listen to what I have to say. If you're comfortable with Dotna Core where it stands, you can uh, sort of skip this video or watch it if you, if you want to. You know, but basically I'm going to try to give you a clearer picture of where .NET Core stands in uh, the web programming world and the programming world and the computer world in general. And if you have ever seen or tried to figure out what .NET Core is or rather tried to understand more about it, you've seen a diagram that sort of looks something like this and you have your .NET framework and sort of its subcategories .NET Core and it's uh, subcategories Xamarin, uh, it's subcategories, and then you have the .NET standard, and then you have all of this stuff. When I struggled with this, uh, the the reason I couldn't understand this is because this .NET Core is like step 10, right? And you can't start at step 10. It's like the 10th floor, you know? So... You can't just appear on the 10th floor, you, you start at the first floor. So, where do the computers start, right? The computers start at the computer, the hardware, right? Now, at the beginning, when uh, Alan Turing invented the computers and all that stuff and all the old people were programming, they were using machine code. So these are your ones and zeros, and as you can imagine, Programming in machine code can be boring and hard and prone to error because you cannot read it as a human being. So what programmers did, instead of writing machine code, they would write a compiler and they would start writing assembly code. Right? And once they finished writing assembly code, they would pop it into a compiler and this would spit out the machine code, which can then be used on your computer. And now, if you look at how the assembly code sort of, sort of looked, so you'd have a um, sort of an instruction, the address, so the point in memory, uh, so the CPU would have like four addresses or something like that, and you'd have to, they'd work like a stack, you'd have to like, move from one address to another push pop and uh, if you don't if you're not a skilled programmer you're not going to understand it basically this was complicated way to write code as well again so they just take it a step further from assembly into higher level programming languages right so again you have a compiler which gets fed some code and that that spits it out into assembly now, the high-level programming languages is something that a human can read and understand more clearly. It's closer to an English language than a set of instructions. So these are your languages like C, C++, C Sharp, Java, Clojure, Haskell, uh, COBOL, Fortran, Lisp, uh, Ruby, PHP, it's all of, all of them languages. Well, they are high level languages, and usually the way they work is in two ways. Either they go through a compiler into assembly code, into machine code. And this is what happens, tends to happen with C and C. That's why if you ever look up sort of performance, um, perform performance metrics for C and C, you're always going to see them topping the charts because they compile directly into machine code. And that's why they're super fast. Now, codes, uh, languages like C Sharp and Java, they are a little bit different to C++ and C. The reason for that is it's something, so I'll just quickly draw a line here. It, it, basically, it's called a virtual machine. So let's draw a virtu virtual machine here. And a virtual machine, you can think of it as a box, right? 
and the box will get fed its Java program, right? And then this virtual machine will take this Java code and it will spit out maybe one, two, three different versions of machine code right it, it could it could do this right it won't do it purposely but it will do it and it might do one for windows one for apple and one for linux right so and this virtual machine this would get written in something like c plus plus so sometimes you know programmers aren't uh, pro programs don't work on every platform. So if you write something on Windows, it's not going to work on Apple. Or if you write something on Apple, it might not work on Windows. And But if you write Java code or C Sharp code, some of it, depending on which virtual machine you use, right? Java is platform independent, so you can write Java and it will run on any iOS. C Sharp is not like that. But this is where .NET Core comes in, and uh, this .NET Core is it works on any platform because of the virtual machine that Microsoft made. Now, knowing this, that sort of we write code in C Sharp, right? And our code will bop into a virtual machine, right? And this virtual machine will then spit out code for whichever platform we need. Right, and this code will then convert into machine code. Okay, so let's go and now let's go into the GitHub repository for Microsoft and uh, let's look at CoreFX. Now, whatever it says here, you can read it, but basically, long story short, we go into the source file, source folder, right? And you can see all of these folders, right? And you're, if you remember in the earlier earlier episodes when I talked about namespaces and I tried to make a link between the uh, reference, references you have and uh, the names you have there, these are basically namespaces. And inside these namespaces, all it is is just files with the implemented functionality. So if you go deep enough, you'll find that one file and we'll have a bunch of code in there. And... These are basically the namespaces that you bring up for like parsing JSON uh, link. A link will probably have its own, uh, what's it called, uh, repository, not the part of the core effects. But yeah, basically, whatever you need for .NET Core, when you build it on your in your Visual Studios, right? All the libraries, everything, this is located here. And now, what happens when you, for example, do .NET Publish and you want to run it, right? So you need the J, uh, the, the the what's it called, the virtual machine. So you can see that the core CLR right here on the top or at the bottom, it will, it says that it uses the JIT compiler. And if you go into the source code, um, I don't know, core CLR hosts. Okay. If, you dive deep, if you dive deep enough, you will find files .cpp and .h. So these are headers and uh, implementation files for C++. And this is basically your picture here. The core CLR of Microsoft wrote. CLR. But the core CLR is your virtual machine. CoreFX is C sharp, right? But it's a bunch of built in classes, right? So this is what sort of framework means. Imagine not having imagine having the core CLR, but not CoreFX, right? So you have a place to sort of put your code and make it run on any platform, but you don't have like the scaffolding, the tools, you don't have a hammer, you don't have a saw to like chop the wood and then nail it together into like a, a house, right? So the framework and what CoreFX is, is the framework. And that's what sort of allows you to have that sort of 
let me just draw the best tool basket you've ever, ever seen. Little hammer in here. There we go. Right. This is your. FX, right? This is your core FX. This is your tool basket. And it uses C sharp, right? So once you're bi finished building, you put it into this VM, and this VM then spits out machine code on whichever machine you use it be it Apple, Linux, or Windows. Okay, so now that you sort of understand how the code that you write gets to the machine. We can talk a little bit about .NET Standard. And .NET Standard is, you haven't written a, .NET Core, a library for .NET Core, but basically .NET Standard, all this is, is basically it's a set of rules. It's a set of rules that say, right, you need to make uh, this library like this, like this, like this, and follow this pattern. Otherwise, we can't guarantee that this library that you wrote will work for .NET and .NET Core and Xamarin and their whole stack, which is explained here. This is what this .NET standard means. Basically, a standard set of rules that you follow when you write a library, it's going to work for all of these platforms. Okay, so if you, again, just, just adding more information to here, when you... When you when we downloaded the uh, .NET Core in the in the first episode and installed it, what exactly did we install with the .NET Core runtime and download .dot .NET Core SDK? Now try to think about it: SDK and runtime. So run apps, build apps. If you think about it, what I explained here, you would probably should already get a picture that run apps means a VM build apps, the tool set. But the SDK not only includes uh, the core effects, it also includes the CLI. And CLI, um, just to quickly show you what it really is, is if you go into your C drive, maybe .NET, right? Basically, .NET XE, let's open a PowerShell here. And if we type in .NET, right, all it's going to do is through your Windows environment variables, it's going to, wherever, whichever path you're located at, when you type in .NET, it's going to go into your environment variables, find this .NET exe, and whichever files it has installed here, all the commands, all the code that it contains to execute, to do whatever whenever you type in a certain command. It, it, it has all the code to handle these commands right here. So when you create a new project, it may fetch it from the internet, etc. But you get the picture of that. This right here in this folder is all the functionality for your .NET CLI. <coughs> now, if you ever heard of Kestrel, to quickly explain to you what it sort of is, uh, let's make a new painting and uh, basically I'm not going to explain everything about networking because I'm not a network kind of guy but to keep things short and simple when we, if you remember when we installed IS uh, information services this is what basically is this big wall where requests comes in and requests come out and responses come out IS handles all that heavy lifting and basically you can have multiple websites Right, and it will know where to put which request and then take the response and send that re response. So let's take one website, for example. It's a .NET Core website. What happens? We built it. We, we basically, we made the application, we built it, we published it, and it spit out some uh, code for us. In that code, what essentially will happen basically is it will have this box. And here will be the app that we have been building. On this side, it's going to be Kestrel. So when you publish an app, 
Estrel is going to be included in there, and this is what happened. Uh, this is what basically uh, hosts your app and communicates between whichever whichever server you choose, uh, serving platform you choose, like NGINX, Apache, uh, whatever. I don't think you can use Apache for docking or basically. Besides the point, you have some sort of a server you decide to host on, and then on that server you put this app. And Kestrel is included in that app and helps you handle requests and basically helps you run uh, the app and communicates with that server to handle requests. So I'm ho hopefully this made a little bit more sense about how it gets hosted. And as this will be it for this video, hopefully I cleared the sum up and created way more questions than I answered. This is the man it's meant to be. Now you, I'll leave some links in the description where you can sort of go around digging and try to make your own sense of the uh, big picture. If I helped you understand more, please uh, leave a comment. If you if you have a, any questions, leave a comment. The, your comments motivate me to make more videos. And uh, if uh, you would like to further support me, please do uh, support me on Patreon. Uh, you can also support what's it called by using affiliate links for hosting uh, that I talked about. In previous videos but yeah, other than that guys leave a comment if you have any questions subscribe like and uh, see you in the next video